things do change. It doesn't always stay the same. And I, uh, I want to encourage you to do what you can do with where you are. See, some of you may get to the place where you say, I, have, uh, I found out that I can live without God. I don't, I don't need to go to church. And I, I, don't, I don't need to support it. I, I don't need to pray to God because he's failed me or he let me down. You'd be surprised how easy it would be to turn on the Lord. You've lived how long now without Christian fellowship, congregational singing, the words of encouragement from each other. See, all these things can happen. So I definitely want you to stay tuned for today's message. Don't just listen to the announcements in a song. I want you to hear what i got to say today. Have you ever wondered where people got the idea that their bad works send them to hell and their good works send them to heaven? Well, I want to show you what the Bible has to say. So I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Revelation in chapter 20. So you see, if everybody is going to be judged by their works, there must be a reason. It has to determine something. But just what is it that's going to be determined by the judging of the people that were placed up on the earth. Now, I want you to notice up here, <clears throat> this book right here, this is the book of the living. <clears throat> this is the book of eternal life. Two books. We're going to look at these books. And the reason I want you to see there in Revelation in chapter 20 and verse 11 is this. You need to see what's going to happen is at this great white throne judgment at the end of time. And maybe this is where a lot of people get the idea that, you know, you've got to be good to go to heaven. And if you're bad, you're going to hell. In verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. So there's different books. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged Every man, according to their works. Every man is going to be judged according to his works. Now, why is God going to judge every man according to the works if their works don't determine something? So I want you to follow with me this morning because the answer is very, very important to those that believe and to those that don't believe. But you'll have to admit, it's in the Bible. And it talks about the books. Now, the lost will be judged out of the books. And then there is the book of life. So we're going to take a look and see if we can come to the conclusion of what he's talking about here. So I want you to take your Bible and go with me all the way to the book of Genesis in chapter 5. Genesis and chapter 5. Now, if I go a little too fast, it's better to have a piece of paper and just jot down the Scripture references and try to look them up later. I will try not to go too fast. But I got so much material that I want to cover. But I want you to look there in the book of Genesis in chapter 5. You'll notice now, this is the first book in the Bible. And this is in chapter 5, and this is what it says. This is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. And then you'll notice it goes down here and says something in verse 5. Look in verse 5. 
And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. <clears throat> and you see those next three words? And he died. Now, this is the book of the generation of Adam. So the book of the living began with the first man that was born into the world or created by God. And then there's another one that also, and you'll see there in verse 8, where it says, In all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And he died. Verse 11 says, And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. In verse 27, it says, And all the days of Methuselah. You've heard of old Methuselah? 969 years, but he still died. So you see, in the book of the living, you live till you die. But everyone is going to die. And that's why these scriptures are so important to remember. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew and chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 because it's going to show you a little bit about what's going to be brought into this judgment. Because every man that lives is going to die. And God says he's going to be judged for what he's done. So notice what he says here in Matthew chapter 12. And you'll notice there in verse 35. Verse 35. A good man out of the good treasures of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof. And you see those next words? In the day of judgment. Every idle word. You see... Your words are the result of how you think, and God knows the thoughts of every individual. He knows the motive of every individual. And then he makes this statement. You see there in verse 37, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So there's something about this judgment, you're going to be justified or condemned. Doesn't look so good, does it? Because, you see, we're going to be judged by a perfect God. And we are sinful men. And God, we often say, well, God keeps the books. <laughs> he sure does. You see, this is when you were born into the world. This book here is so much bigger because there's so many more people that are born into the world than those that are born into God's family. See, the book of eternal life is those who have trusted Christ as Savior. So there's two books. These came from over here. You see, we were all born into this world in a flesh birth. But not all of these are born into God's family. So now, what made the difference and why is everybody going to be judged? I think it's important to see this. So take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark. The book of Mark in chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And there's a verse that kind of gives you an idea of why we are the way we are. We may not like the way we are. We just can't help ourselves sometimes. We have a sinful nature. It's not what's going on on the outside of man that's the problem. It's what's going on on the inside of a person that's the problem. You see, it's not the fruit. It's the root. There's a root problem. And sometimes all people are doing is trying to pick off the fruit, and they can't change the root. We're sinners by nature. Look what he says in verse 20. And Jesus speaking, he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, 
adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. And now look in verse 23. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So it's not food that you eat. It's not you didn't wash your hands. It's because you and I were, well, the Bible says an evil heart. It's talking about, like in Jeremiah 17, it talks about the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. And nobody understands it like God. That's why we are so easily deceived. We deceive ourselves. I'm not that bad. I mean, I didn't rob a bank. I didn't kill anybody. So I'm not that bad. But you'd be surprised how you can be filled with envy and bitterness and jealousy and strife and have wrong thoughts, evil thoughts of all kinds. So the Bible says every man is going to be judged because every man judges God. You see, we wonder whether or not if God is so right, why did he let this happen? So we don't see the reason for it. Well, if God really loves me, he won't let this happen to me. But he did. So we, we just know God is wrong. God did me dirty. God got up this morning on the wrong side of the bed, and he's, he's out to get me today. And so we can sometimes, well, we judge too harshly. We blame God for something God didn't do. We blame the devil for things the devil didn't do. So I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, there's a one little bitty verse, but it says an awful lot. But you'll notice there in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, because every man has a sinful nature. So we sin. That's why we do what we do. He says the wages of sin is death. So therefore, God says, it is appointed unto every man, every man, wants to die. You only die once. Every man to die. After death, judgment. So that you know, whether you like it or not. You say, I didn't ask to be born. Who did? But this is the facts, and this is where, he, where it is, and this is what's going to happen. So God says, as it is appointed unto every man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And the reason he stresses that once to die is because when Jesus Christ died for man, he only had to do it once. Why? Because man only dies once. He's not going to come down next year and pay for what you did this year. <clears throat> You only die once. Regardless of how long you live, how many sins you commit in your life, you still only die one time. Regardless of the number of sins. So when Christ died for you, he only had to die once. And that covered all of your sins because of one death. Now, that is important to know. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms. Way back here in the book of Psalms. And... Um, there's a, a couple of verses that I want you to see. And you need to know that when you trust Christ as your Savior, you're born into God's family. Well, that's a new birth, a new family, new book. But in the old book, you need to see what he's saying. So see there in chapter 69, look in verse 27. Add iniquity unto their iniquity. Let them not come into thy righteousness. You see, the more we sin, God says, you're just adding to it. But God has a perfect heaven, a perfect place. And you can't enter into where God has his righteousness because we would contaminate heaven. See, if we all went to heaven with Say, with the virus that we have here, wouldn't it be a shame to go to heaven and we got all the angels and all the people in heaven, we gave them the virus? Not going to happen. In verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. See, now, look up here. I got these two books. This is when you were born into the world. 
And the Lord is keeping a record. It's written in the book. He's writing down. He got everything written in the book. Do you think God keeps good books? I'll bet you he does. And he keeps everything in his book. So he writes all the stuff down, and one of the days, the books are going to be open, and you and I are going to be judged out of this book. And it ain't going to be pretty. Because God will have all the evidence that he needs to be justified, whatever his decision is concerning you and me. So he says here in verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of living. See, in the book of living, see, you can die. You can die. That's why in Genesis chapter 5, in the very first verse there, this is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created him. But he still died. So you can be blotted out of living, and you're going to die. But see, there's some good news to all of this, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Exodus the book of Exodus. Way back there in the book of Exodus, in chapter 32. Chapter 32. Children of Israel had really messed up. God had given to Moses the Ten Commandments. He came down and showed them. But everything was going wrong. Everything was going wrong. And so um, God was really upset. He was angry. So he says here in verse 30, we'll just start there in verse 30. It says in Exodus chapter 32, verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. In other words, whether you're going to live or die. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. And have made them gods of gold. Remember, they got the gold, made a golden calf. He can thank his his brother for that, Aaron. And then in verse 30, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I not blot out of my book. Him will I blot out of my book. So this is a result of the book of the living because you can be blotted out of life. You're alive and you can die. Now, Moses wasn't talking about the book of life because in the book of life, well, it's different. So you wonder, well, why is there going to be this judgment? There's going to be this judgment because, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going to see that in just a moment. But what I want you to do is look at the rest of this verse here. Look there in verse 35. And the Lord plagued the people. So, you see, because of sin that we do, God can take your life early. You can play the fool and jump off the Empire State Building and, well, you know, halfway down, so far so good, but you know that it's, it's an appointment you're going to keep with the concrete. And so some people ruin their lives, and they die early. Some people commit crimes, and they are punished, and they have an execution, and that's it. And some people are slowly committing suicide. As somebody asked me, he says, can you commit suicide and still go to heaven? Well, is suicide a sin? Well, yes, paid. It's paid. All sin was paid when Christ died on the cross for us. So when you trust Christ as Savior, He gives you eternal life. And that's important to remember. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 13. The book of Revelation, chapter 13. Now, while you're turning there, I'll just mention this to you. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 1, first book in the New Testament, it says, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. And it lists a whole bunch of people. But there's no, no deaths recorded there. Now, remember this. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you're born into God's family. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans 9, 8, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God. So those that are in the flesh birth, you're in the book of living. 
when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were born into God's family. So your new birth has eternal life. You see, you receive eternal life the very moment you trust Christ as Savior. You're born into God's family. Well, born into God's family means that um, you were born without that sinful nature. You see, you don't have that root problem in the new birth. You had a root problem in the flesh birth. But when you trusted Christ as your Savior, you didn't get a sinful nature. The sinful nature is only in the flesh birth. So since God is your Father, and He is perfect and righteous and just, so is the new birth. So the new birth has eternal life. It means He can live forever. And because He lives forever, because He doesn't sin. And if He doesn't sin, He can't die. So this is the book of eternal life. The book of life. And that's what we have in Christ Now, here in the book of Revelation in chapter 13, I want you to look at this with me. In chapter 13, look there in verse 8. And he makes this statement. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, talking about this beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, this book of life is those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. So those who trusted Christ as their Savior, whose names are in the Lamb's book of life, according to this verse, are not going to accept the mark of the beast. And they will not have to worry about that. But there's people whose names are not in the book of life. That's what I want you to see. Verse 8, whose names are not written in the book. Their names are not written in the book. So the key is we're all born into this world, and so we're in the book of living. So when you trust Christ as your Savior, your name is written in the book of life, a different book, your second birth. And when I was a lost man, everything I did in the flesh, put in the book. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, and now I got a new book, Now, nothing of the flesh birth goes into this book. Nothing of the flesh birth goes into this book. It only goes into this book. And there's a reason for that, and I will explain that in just a moment. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke. The book of Luke. And chapter 10. The book of Luke and chapter 10. Jesus has gotten his disciples together. He has about 70 of them. He's going to send them out two by two. And uh, so he says some things to them. He gave them power to do certain things. He, they could do some miracles and, and all of that. But he says in verse 1 of Luke chapter 10, verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed others 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his vineyard, into the harvest. So God wants there to be people that will go into the harvest. Now, Look in verse 8. Look in verse 8. In verse 8, he tells them this, And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, saying to them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God. Now, if we can overlay the gospel of uh, John, we know that, the kingdom of God is also, uh, there's a portion of Scripture there that says in John chapter 3 and verse 3 and 5, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God or to enter the kingdom of God. The spiritual realm requires the new birth. And so he makes a statement here. The kingdom of God is nigh unto you. In other words, it's right here. It's at your door. You have an opportunity right now. Did you know that there's still people who will not 
believe, who are here right now, hear the gospel, and will reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. And yet they're so close, even at the doors, and they turn away from it. They rebel against it. Don't want anything to do with it. And So then he says, but into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, even the very dust of your city. He says, we're, we're, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this. Get this verse. Be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. In other words, you're having an opportunity. You can be sure of that. God has got people, and they preach the gospel. There's churches, and there's a, there's a certain knowledge within every individual that wants to know God, wants to know truth. But because they get to the place where they can educate themselves to the place where there is no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, and they can deny all of it if they want to. But you can be so close. Think about Judas. Judas was the man who kissed the door of heaven and went to hell. Jesus says, I am the door. He kissed the door of heaven and went to hell. And he says this in verse 12, For I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. More tolerable. You see, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they died physically. Whether now they were believers there or not, that's not my issue right now. More tolerable means that they're both going to be judged, but there's going to be something more tolerable because of the amount of light that they had. Some people have more light than others, but all have light. This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man has certain amounts of evidence given to him where it can lead him to God. You follow truth, and truth will follow, and I mean, I should say, lead you to the source of truth, which is the Lord. Follow light, and light goes to the source. And people can know God. Now, get what else he says. In verse 13, woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if, if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented sitting in sackcloth and ash. In other words, it would have been different with them if they had the knowledge that you now have. Talking about a physical death. They died because of this. And there's eternal consequences. A judgment is going to take place. And it's going to be more tolerable for some than for others. Because God is just and righteous. God does no wrong. Don't let your doubts and curiosity of not understanding everything cause you to question God. It's not God who is limited in knowledge and understanding. It's you and I. We don't always see everything. But it shall, in verse 14, be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So, Every man is going to be judged. Every man has to stand there. And so then he makes this statement in verse 15. But thou and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be brought or thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despises you despises me, and he that despiseth me despises him that sent me. So the 70 returned after having all of this power to do all these miracles. And they said, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And then in verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, what Christ did for these disciples that went out and had all this power. And they were so excited. It says up there, returned again with joy. He says, you're happy about that? Because you had power? You could do all those things? So he says in verse 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice. 
and this rejoice not. And the spirits are subject unto you, or that the spiritual subject unto you. But get this, you ought to underline it in your Bible. But rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. In other words, the most important thing that will ever happen to you in your whole life is that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That your name is in the book of eternal life. In other words, it boils down to, have you been born again? Have you been born into God's family? And when you trust Christ as your Savior, He gives you everlasting life. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me over there to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. And chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And you'll notice that there is a verse here in verse 3 that I want you to see because it explains it a little bit better. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. In other words, you were alive in the flesh. You accepted Christ's death, so you were dead. You trusted Christ as Savior, so you're alive, born again, alive again. You see, I was in the flesh, and I died. I accepted Christ's death. And I am alive again, born again, born from above. And notice what he says in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. He says, Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You see, this book of life is in heaven, and none of us can change it. We can't alter this book. And he says in verse 5, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, we didn't save ourselves, and we don't keep ourselves saved. That's something that the Lord does for us. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, I want you to see this because a lot of people think, well, there's a verse that tells you that you can um, be cast out of the book of life. No, it says just the opposite. You see, in Revelation chapter 3, to the church at Sardis, it says, you have a name that you're alive. He said, but you're dead. Saved, but you're asleep. And that's why in Ephesians it says, awake out of sleep. Redeem in time. Well, some people will and some people won't. And so he says here, and I want you to see this. Look there in verse 4. In verse 4. And he says here in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You cannot find a verse where God ever cast out or blotted out any man's life out of the book of eternal life. There is no verse. This is a security that God says, I will not block your name out of the book of life or blot it out. This verse is talking about, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angel. So when you go to Matthew in chapter 10, so hold your place here in Revelation and just go over to the book of Matthew in chapter 10. And there is a, um, a verse that needs to be explained because of these believers in the church at Sardis and how it can relate to this. See there in Matthew chapter 10, look now in verse 32, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Some will and some won't. Talking about services, not talking about salvation, not talking about how to get to heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, he can't deny you salvation because that wasn't based upon you confessing Christ before man for salvation. 
but he can deny you rewards. So if I serve him now and confess Christ before men, which is not a one-time deal in the front of a church, but he's talking about this is a purpose in, of your life, then God says, I'll reward you. But if you don't, then I'm not going to reward you. I'm going to deny you the rewards you could have had. So now, you'll look there in chapter 10, and you'll notice what he says in verse 41. And notice that he's talking about rewards, not salvation. So in verse 41, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's, see that word, reward. Salvation is free. That's the gift of God. Rewards, what you have when you get to heaven, that's earned. That's what you did for Christ. And then in verse 42, and whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Disciple means in service. Verily I say to you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So he's not going to lose his reward because he's not going to blot his name out of the book of life. So whether you obey or you disobey, you're never going to be blotted out of the book. Even these people that maybe not serve the Lord, your name will never be cast out of the book of life. Once you have eternal life, you have eternal life for all eternity. Now, we won't turn to these two verses, but I'll just mention them. And one of them is in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, where it says, And we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You see, those who know Christ as Savior, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, it is a rewarding stand. God is going to reward you for the things that you did for Him. And you're going to suffer the consequences of what you could have had and didn't do. You see, God knows the potential of every person. We're not going to heaven and be judged according to our sins, but according to the works. And there is going to be concerning the quality of our works, what we've done for the Lord. And God says, this is for the believers, believers. So since I have already, as far as this book goes, I've been born into God's family. This book can never be applied to me. This book has no hold on me. He said, but what about all those bad things that you did? God said, they'll remember them no more. Cast as far as the east is from the west and into the deepest sea. I'll never have to count for sin, but I'm going to be rewarded. And that's why God is going to judge all of those who trust the Christ the Savior according to your works. And you're going to be rewarded for what you did. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you're going to suffer the loss of what you could have had. In other words, you could have had if you'd have done more for him. So all of our decisions are important. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. We have been around the world. We've been to the book of Genesis and everywhere in between. But in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. I want you to look once again there at verse 12. Remember now, this is the great white throne judgment. This judgment is for all those that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. This judgment is to those who are in the book of the living, those that were children of the flesh, those that never trusted Christ as their Savior. So the lost man, the lost man, the man who rejected Christ is going to be judged by his works at the great white throne judgment. And this judgment here is only for those, these people. Now get what he says. And I saw the dead, verse 12, small and great stand before God. So everybody's going to get their day in court. And you're going to be tried in a court of divine justice. And the books were open over here. And another book was open, this book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things. That's those who are lost. Judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now remember, this judgment does not determine destination. The judgment does not determine destination. You see, whenever... The believers stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That doesn't determine destination. 
Our destination was determined by did we or did we not trust Christ as our Savior. This is going to determine the reward you get for all eternity. The lost man stands at the great white throne judgment. He is going to be judged according to the light that he had, the things that he did, the thoughts that he had, and every idle word to determine the amount of punishment he receives in hell. Ours is the blessings in heaven and rewards, and the lost man is going to be judged according to his works to determine the punishment he receives in hell. And not everybody had the same light. Not everybody had the same amount of light. Not everybody did the same thing, as wicked as each other. But they all sinned, and they're all condemned. But God is going to be more tolerant of some than others. And they all that were not written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Look what he says here. We're going to jump down to verse 15. Look in verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, if your name isn't in this book, God says you will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. And it didn't have to be that way. In other words, he says in Luke, when we covered it a while ago in verse 10, chapter 10, remember the surety, it was right there. You could have done something about it. Life is so short, eternity is so long, and hell is so hot. This is forever. Now look what he says here in verse 12. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books. Not the book of life. They're not in it. According to their works. So you think you're going to get away with everything? You got away with this. You got away with that. You got away. Do you think the court of divine justice, you're going to get away with anything? Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead, talking about bodies, which were in it. Death, that's the, the, the bodies that are in the graves, and hell, souls that are in hell, delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, they died physically, and now to be separated from God for all eternity. And it doesn't have to be that way. You see there in verse 11, they were not determined by God before they were ever born to go to hell. That's why he says they were found no place for them because God never determined anybody to go to hell. That was placed for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25. But when you reject Jesus Christ, you rejected his love, you rejected his only way of salvation, and a man is saved and saved by grace and grace alone. So remember this, the judgment of the believer is to determine rewards. The judgment of the lost is to determine the punishment that he will receive for all eternity. You know, we often talk about a man is saved by grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It's kind of like a, a little boy that gets some peanut butter and puts it on his bread and he smears it and gets it all over everything. Gets peanut butter all over his hand, all over the knife, all over the table, all over his face. That's the way God's grace is. Like a little boy who spreads it all over everything. You see, regardless of how bad anybody is, God's got some grace and wants to spread it everywhere. The love of God is spread abroad. And God wants to, everybody to hear, everybody to know. That there's a God in heaven that loves you. And right now, He will be your Savior. And if you reject Him as your Savior, He will be your judge. And He keeps the books. He has all the evidence that He needs to condemn you for all eternity. And a tear in your eye is not going to work. It'll be too late. I got another verse I wanted to read to you found in the book of Psalms 143. The book of Psalms 143. 
a verse that I'll just mention to you. Don't have to turn to it. Psalms 39, 4 says, O Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. You realize how easy it is for you to die? How easy it is for you to die? So very easy. Psalms 39, 5 says, Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand's breadth. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Now here in the 143rd Psalm, in verse 8, it says, Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. And I wish that every person could hear about God's loving kindness. You see, God knows how frail you are. He knows all about your sinful nature. He knows how prideful you can be, how difficult it must be to say, I'm just going to trust Christ and Him alone is my only hope of going to heaven. You see, you can't help God save you. You must trust Him totally as your only hope of salvation. And He says, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. And as a child of God, as we read and study the Scripture, it's So that we can know the way that we ought to walk. Because see, this is all here. Temporary. I want to uh, just read a couple of thoughts to you from a good old buddy of mine, Lee Patton. And he said this. Concerning the three biggest fears that man has in life. And we, we have fears. One is the fear of the unknown. We can't see down the road. We can't see into the future. God can, and He's telling us in advance what it holds. He's telling us about a great white throne judgment. He's telling us about a lake of fire. He also tells us about a place called heaven and how wonderful it's going to be, how blissful, pleasures forevermore. And then gives you and I a choice. Where would you like to spend eternity? But the fear of the unknown, our entire lives are filled with anxiety, loss of sleep, worries about the future. We worry about our finances and our health, our jobs, our children, yes, even getting old. Most of our fears are unnecessary. As believers, we know God is in control. We know the one who knows the future. In Isaiah 41.10, he says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. And I know that we often have this thing called fear. You you know, I wrote a little statement. It's just a few words, but I liked it. I'm going to give it to you. We are afraid of being afraid. We're afraid of being afraid. You see, that's why we worry about hoping something don't happen, because we're afraid to be afraid. And so we can't sometimes control what's coming down the road. And so we're afraid to trust God who does. Because, well, I don't know how God's going to solve this or he's going to keep me from this. And God may let you go through a lot of things and want to just give you the strength and the grace to go through it. The second fear is a fear of rejection. We want to be loved and we want to be accepted. We've Fear that people might find out the worst about us. Think about it. Are you afraid that people might find out the worst about you? Remember this. God already knows the worst about you and the worst about me, and He still loves me and accepts me. People may not be as nice as God, but you can know that God knows everything about you, and He loves you, and He loves you. Once they do, they won't like us if they know my worst. They won't like me. Over the years, I've had a lot of people say a lot of things about me, but I know God knows the truth. God knows the truth. And I hate trying to defend myself all the time, so I just let people say whatever they want, think whatever they want. I think it doesn't matter. One day when I get to heaven, God knew the truth. And that's really all that matters. As believers, we know God is in control. But 
total transparency and honesty feels like being naked before other people. We hide by clothing ourselves with lies and falsehood. We long to be accepted, admired, and respected. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.6, God accepts us with our flaws and our faults. He still loves us. Have you ever been rejected? It's a painful thing. It's a painful thing. It's a hurtful thing. The next one is the fear of death. The fear of death. The Bible calls this fear the king of terrors, Job 18, 14. The human race does many things to prolong their days, don't we? We want to do everything we can to prolong our days because we know that uh, death is so um, final. God has appointed our death. He says it's appointed and every man wants to die. So we'll all die one day. And we have not prepared for our death by not having a will and making funeral arrangements. Have you already got those things taken care of? You know you're going to die one day. Have you already got it planned? You know you don't know how long you're going to live, but you know you're going to die. And you have anything that you want to do with whatever you have? Plan now. Be wise. The good news for the believer is the bitterness of death has been conquered. Now let me give you a good statement. Our death will not be a period at the end of a sentence, but a comma. What does a comma mean in a sentence? More to come. See, a period, death does not end it all for us. There's a comma. More to come. We go to heaven, therefore we know the best is yet to come. Now let me give you one final little statement. Cheer up. Cheer up. We will soon all be dead. And it will be final. Except there's more to come. You see, for those who know the Lord know that we're going to heaven when we die. Names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. He told us that rejoice that your names are in. Don't rejoice because you can cast out devils and you can walk on water or you can do this and raise the dead and you can. Uh, that's not important. The most important thing in any man's life is are you going to heaven when you die? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Look up here. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. You see, we were all born into this world. The book of the living. And God knows every thought, every idle word, every deed, all of our sins. And he says, the wages of sin is death. Since we've all sinned, we're all condemned to an eternity separated from God. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven. And he says, you have to be perfect and you're not perfect. You've got a debt to pay because God is just. We've broken God's law. Sin has to be paid. So God says, you cannot save yourself. This hand represents Jesus Christ. It's God in the flesh. He came into this world because he loves us, hates our sin because our sin separates us from him. So what Christ did is he took all the sin of all the world, every person paid for it on the cross, came back again from the dead, and said the only thing he wanted us to do is believe he did it for us. God says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person because God wants Everybody to be saved. God wants everybody to go to heaven. God wants everybody to receive his grace. So God is like the little boy spreading that peanut butter on that bread and getting it over everything. And God wants to spread his grace over everybody. When I was 18 years old, I told the Lord, give me some of that grace. I can't save myself. 
And God saved me because he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I have eternal life. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and I'm going to heaven when I die. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, right now in the quietness of this moment, just between you and the Lord, we you trust him. If you'll accept it right now, he'll save you right now and give eternal life right now. Behold, today, now is the day of salvation. Right on the screen it says, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. If you are understanding what I'm saying, will you trust Christ as your Savior today, right now? Just click on that little button and let us know. Father, we thank you again for your blessings to us. Thank you for the free gift of everlasting life. We're thankful that we can understand some of these things. We don't have all the answers. Don't see it and understand it all. But, Lord, we can see enough of it that I needed to be born again. I need to have my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to be certain that I'm going to heaven when I die. And, Father, the joy that it gives to the person that knows where they're going to spend eternity. So bless the sermon today and help it to be a, a great blessing to every person who hears it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.